Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. We have Jay Glazer. Welcome. What's going on, gang? How we doing? You How are you, man? Fox Sports. Living the dream. Fox NFL Sunday <laughs> and hosting the uh, UFC fights and That's all right. that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, how's it going? Oh man, I just got done. Uh, I've been traveling all over the place you know, on this little book tour of mine, so. I'm struggling a little bit. Not going to lie to you, man. I don't know where I am right now, but it's been great. This is cool. It's just, I, I kind of found my why with this thing. I love that. You got a book out called Unbreakable, How I Turn My Depression and Anxiety mm-hmm. into Motivation, and You Can Too. And the reason I say I love that is because after the pandemic, I mm-hmm. said you got to be more intentional about asking people how they are, but also we got to be more intentional about really telling people yeah. how we are in that moment. So for you to say that I'm struggling a little bit, that's I think that's important. I appreciate that. And you're right. Look, I wrote this. So I have clinical depression anxiety like this the only memory i know is like a child is and it's still like every day of my life i wake up thinking like the sky is falling and the universe hates me and everybody hates me and i know it's not logical Mm -hmm. and also like i know my like on the outside i know my life is great like i'm are you kidding me like i'm sitting here doing a show with you all today Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my life is great but between my ears sucks and it always has and i've always had to like hide it and mask it um and man, that's that's painful, you know, and that causes me to to do a lot of damaging things. So that's my level. So I guess, you know, I'm able to talk about it not because my education, more because my not because my schooling, because more my suffering. But you just said it. Everyone's going through something. Mm-hmm. We just came through a time where we were told to isolate. It's the worst thing we could ever do. Mm-hmm. And then we got in that bad habit of isolating. But even, you know, if, if it's not that. Like, dealing with social media these days. Like, even though our lives are great, we think our lives suck half the time. That's right. Because we're comparing ourselves to everybody else's filtered fraction of one second mm-hmm. of one day, and we're going, damn, why, how come we're not at that party? Why is, how come our food doesn't look like that? How come we're getting left out of here? Or Twitter, like, man, if we got bullied on the playground growing up, it sucked for like two <laughs> weeks, right? Yeah. And now we're seeing a thousand times a second. So the human condition's not meant for that. So because, like you just said, I do all these doodly things, right? Football and fighting and ballers and all this. I want it to be kind of like that voice now. Like, we talk about mental health, but nobody describes it. So I want to be that one that helps describe it and give it a words for people to use. And I love that you, like, you, you, you're you, using what God blessed you with this form to be able to help people through that, mm-hmm. and especially, like, the pandemic. People don't realize it. Mm-hmm. Like, what's going on with me? And you, mm-hmm. and you gave light to a man, which is, I, man, I applaud you on that, man. Well, let's, I really start, do. let's start from the beginning. You're, you're, you're a Jersey kid. You said as a kid, you know, you had these <laughs> thoughts. So so what what gave you those thoughts so young? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, as when you say, right. I know. I know exactly what you mean. Because mm-hmm. I go through the same thing. You, you know, with depression and anxiety. I don't know where those come, right? those come from. We don't know. When did you start saying that? Man, I, the funny part is, I didn't realize I got diagnosed with anxiety in 2010. But then when you start thinking back on your life, especially mm-hmm. when the doctor says, you know, have you had these panic attacks or anxiety attacks before? You start thinking like, yeah, your whole life. Mm-hmm. So for me, I just thought it was normal. It, so, but when did you start feeling comfortable enough to say this publicly? Oh, uh, probably like 2016. 2016? Yeah, like 2016. So that's brave, man. That's cool. Yeah. That's great. That's, again, like no one's questioning my manhood, so I can go and, and preach it from the rafters. Um, but as like a little kid, it's funny too, because I was the one, like my parents were taking me to a therapist as a little kid, mm-hmm. but kind of putting more like, oh, you're the screwed up one. I'm like, whoa, hey, hell, hey, hey. What about you guys who are taking me here? <laughs> like, right, right. you know what I mean? But it, uh, yeah, it really is. It's my only, it's funny because as a little kid, I would get taken upstairs. I was always, I was always lashing out. You know, I have, I have a line in the book here. It was given to me by Sean Payton that hurt people, hurt people. Absolutely. Right? So I was doing that a lot. I was lashing out, right? Because I was always hurt because of my, and I look, I got depression, anxiety, ADD. Like I got freaking everything. I had to go full, you know? Um, and as this kid, I just got, I was always punished, and I was always kind of like, man, why am I like this? And honestly, and this is not me, you know, being a preacher over here, I started talking to God. Like, I was by myself, alone, all the time. And, like, for me, in the book, I'm like, hey, I need teammates. And teammates can come in all, you know, walks of life. They could be my fight team or my Fox NFL Sunday team or my, I got a rescue pit, my son, I adopted a kid. I, he's part of it, but God also for me. So I just, but I look for teams, so I just started talking to someone as a little kid because I was so alone. And when you have this, um, especially back then, I'm 52 now, you really feel lonely. And the reason why I asked you when you started talking about it, it it was lonely for a a long time. And the more we could start talking about it, the more we could realize that we're not 
Like, we may be messed up, but I'm good with my messed upness. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we're, we're not alone in this. You yeah, know? In order to eradicate the stigma, you know, everybody got to tell yeah. these stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's all. That's exactly right. And again, like, th- there's two there's two things I could do every every morning. Yeah, when I say it's hard, like, it's hard for me to get out of bed every single morning. It was this morning. Um, sometimes harder than others. But I got to make that decision every day. All right, once I do get out of bed, I'm going to go be relentless in my life. But again, some days are really freaking hard for me to get out of bed because... The sky is falling. Why do I want to get out of bed when the sky's about to crash down? My world's about to crash down. Everything I've ever worked for, it's going to go. Everybody hates me. Nobody loves me. And again, it's not, it's not freaking logical. Right. It doesn't make any sense. But this thing doesn't make a lot of sense. That's right. Right? So it's, um, again, I gotta, I've had to use this as my own. I've had to use my depression, anxiety, my mental health issues to motivate me. I couldn't let it uh, come crashing down. And I say motivate me at like, part of this Part of what depression, anxiety, mental health does for you is it uh, prevents you from having a lot of self-worth. Mm. Right? When did you know it was time to write Absolutely. the book? When, when, when it was like, this is my time to tell my story? Um, so I have, I have a charity called MVP, Emerging Vets and Players, where I take these former combat vets mm-hmm. who are struggling for when the uniform comes off, and I merge them together with ex-football players and the uniform comes off, and I you know, was in the fight game. A lot of my fighters, when they're, they put the gloves down, they're, they're struggling, and I'm like, again... They don't have a team. So I'm like, I'm just going to, it just makes, I know they don't have the same job, but it makes sense to put them all together so they can remind each other what their greatness is. So I talk about it openly with them. And we're in seven cities right now. got one here. It's pretty cool. We'll have like 80 or 90 badasses, men, women, everything just together. And we train for about a half hour, but then after we have these mental health huddles. Mm -hmm. And um, one day I was just talking about what we talk about in those huddles. We're so vulnerable in there. Mm-hmm. Here are the baddest dude and women on the planet, and they're so open and vulnerable. And I talked about it publicly, and people are like, "Oh my God, this guy, you got that? You?" Got... I'm like, "Yeah, like I, I'm an open book. I don't, I don't. Well, I shouldn't say I don't hide anything because I did for a long time. Um, but I don't mind talking about anything. Like I'm, again, my 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 scars are what I'm proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, so once that happened a couple years ago, um, I started talking about it more and more, and then I got approached to do a book. And they wanted me to do like a football book. I'm like, nah, I'm not going to look over my shoulder the rest of my life with all the secrets I know. Hell no. Um, but when they said I could be of service and write a book about this, and again, I, I, I like to kind of be the first of something. And we talk about mental health, but I think this is the first book that really gives it words, allows you and you and you to have this conversation with your friends and your loved ones. And you're like, I got, it's so cool. I got like 80 year old grandmothers reaching out now saying for the first time in my life, I'm able to have this conversation with my husband, kids, and grandkids. I'm about, I think, to, I'm um, about to start crying right here because it's like, it does. It's like, I found my why. It's like mm-hmm. a lot of girl dads. Yeah, I got four. Right? And they're like, I got a lot of girl dads saying, I don't have it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> In some form or the other, right? But now I have a way to connect with my mm-hmm. my kids about it, which has been, like, again, for somebody like me with such low self-worth and, and a lot of self-loathing actually that's been um i find myself crying a lot more now in a, in a good way yeah i didn't get to a place of worry till december of uh 2019 but i think to your point about your book i think that um the difference is we're not experts we're just people who have experiences yes. so we're sharing our experiences mm-hmm. like i put my book out you know shook one anxiety playing tricks on me and it was the same thing like i was just Sharing my experiences, you know what I'm saying. Oh, man, I love so it. I think I think now I right that, right that's now. what yeah. happens when you you're giving people yeah. language just because you're just talking mm-hmm. about it. You're not a doctor. You're not giving no clinic, yes. no clinical right. We're not therapists, right? Yeah, nah. right. Just We're just dudes about trying to give them words. That's yes, right. That's and you know, right. I tell you know, I was saying before that again. I kind of use this as motivation because I didn't know how to love myself from the inside out. It's caused me to do all these great things and be the first of and you know in the football world or the fight world or, or charities or ballers, I had to use it to go get the motivation to get some love from the from the outside in. But like you're saying about um, about kind of like starting to open up about you asked to, and this thing has its own set of rules, mm-hmm. right? So Michael Strahan has been my best friend since 1993. Wow. Right? We met each other first day on the job. No one talked to me covering the Giants. Nobody talked to him because he was drafted to replace Lawrence Taylor and LT was still on the team. So right. it wasn't good. He got bad teeth and speech impediment, his goofy dude. So, and he wasn't playing. No one talked to us. Um, so y'all both rookies? But I was, yeah, I was, I was a rookie reporter. He was a rookie player. Okay. But he didn't really come on scene until five years in. People don't realize. Like, they thought he was Michael Strahan at the gate. He wasn't. And actually, 
part of this book was my early journey, too, of me trying to get to where I was in my career. First 11 years of my career, I was making 9700 bucks a year, living here in New York. So I, I, I have no idea how I paid anything, my rent or my, and my gas and electricity <laughs> I put off. It was terrible, but I was like, man, I'm going to outwork the world getting here, mm-hmm. right? And actually, Strahan would drive me. I, I didn't have enough money to go from New York City, subway bus, out to Giant Stadium, back every day. So for eight years, he drove me back into New York every single day. How, how did y'all become so close? Because no one talked to either one of us. Oh, <laughs> I'm dead serious. Gotcha. Literally, gotcha. yeah. yeah. Nobody yeah. talked to either one of us. Up. And they made fun of us yeah. how close we were. So I'm getting somewhere with the story. Tell mm-hmm. me about that first that first meeting, though. You He over there by himself, you by yourself. Oh. Like, who made the first no, no, approach, so, the approach to? No, so um, we both laughed at somebody else's expense. And we're the only morons to do it. Some, some There's an old guy who was, was an executive for the Giants, and this guy was like... Um, Man, he was like this older exec who, how do I describe this guy without insulting the hell out of him? He was like albino with like a white George Costanza hair and he had like a lazy <laughs> eye going one way. There goes the whole insulting thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> I just heard a description. That's all I heard. I didn't hear no insults. This dude tries to hop over this fence at, at John's training camp and he catches his shorts and he, boom, hits the other side and he rolls down the hill and his hat's still up like on the fence and he had like a piece of sod here on his head and he had a lazy eye so it kind of looked like the cartoons where like the birds are flying over <laughs> right, his head. Right, right, right. And because he was a big exec- executive, nobody laughed at him except for two morons. <laughs> you were that is it. And we laugh loud and we're like pointing like from Dumb and Dumber. Like, <laughs> you know, we're just, and afterwards he's like, oh my God, thank you so much for, <laughs> for being the other moron here. And that's, how we latched on. Wow. Um, so again, I man, it it took me 11 years to get my first full time job, but because of this depression, I had to go for it. Had to go for it. So now again, I'm getting here somewhere. Mm-hmm. So he's known me obviously better than anybody else since '93. It wasn't until two and a half months ago that I had my first talk with him about this. Wow. And like I've talked so openly with everywhere else, and he and I were supposed to go out to dinner a few months ago during the season, and for the first time, I said to him, hey, man, I can't go tonight. He said, why? I said, man, the beast just got out of the box. I had an anxiety attack, man, that just, um, in the past, I would have, when it, when it happened, um, I would have dealt with it in a different way. I would have taken a Vicodin and had a bunch of cocktails and gone out there and just handled it differently and, mm-hmm. you know, gotten, gotten in all sorts of trouble because I just want to hide it. And now I know to talk about it and, and tell people, so I said, Man, I can't go to dinner. Um, Beast just got in the box. He just kicked my ass today. Mm. And he said, um, "You want to talk about it?" I said, mm, "Not, not, not right now." And he said, "You want me to come over?" I said, "No." And he literally said, "Why have you never told me about this?" Mm. And I said, "Like, I don't make the rules up of mental health. Like, for whatever reason, I felt ashamed with you. Mm-hmm. But if I didn't, which is why I'm, you know." selling this book now and pushing the, the, what I have in this book. If I didn't have that, if I felt comfortable enough to say to him 30 years ago, what I said to him two and a half months ago, I would have had somebody walk in this walk with me. I would have had somebody right there I could have turned right. to, right, instead of handling it the wrong way. And that's the whole point of, like, you coming out and talking about me, coming out and talking about it. we got to show people it's okay. And he wasn't ashamed of me. Like, he wasn't. No, Not one person, as I have talked about this, not one person has called me a wuss. Not one person told me to suck it up. It's gone the other way. It's got me closer together with all these cats. And they're the most doodly dudes in the world, you know? And Even it, that, man, would you just explain? That's the most freeing thing in the world. Because yeah. it's like, it's so many times I won't show up for something. Or I'll make up an excuse not to go. When the reality is I'm just having a panic attack. Yeah. And, I'm, and it's just the thought of having to be there. I know when I go there, I'm going to have a panic attack as well. Yes. So it's just like, I don't want to go. And I'll right? do, I mean, I'll do it at the last minute, like hour before, mm-hmm. like, nope, Charlemagne ain't coming. He said you're not coming. And, and then you just think you're a diva. You're not a diva. That's right. Right. You're that's hurting. Right. And you know what? That's so right. here's the other crazy part. And I describe it here. My first anxiety or panic attack was in an empty radio stadium in 2005. Okay. And it didn't make any sense why it happened. Like, I, I'm, I'm great in chaos. I suck in calm, but I'm great in chaos. So I'm good in a cage. I'm good on TV. The rest of the world, I'm, I struggle a lot. Um, Why is that? I, again, I no, I, I, mean, I be talking to my therapist right? about that. Why are we good in chaos? Mm-hmm. Why? And then we cause chaos when it's calm, right? <laughs> and then we feel ashamed that we just caused all this chaos, <laughs> right? Oh man! So, but it, but that 
you being good in chaos allows you to be who you are and what you are. Mm-hmm. Right? That's where we got to stop apologizing. Like, again, we do feel better, right? We feel after that happens, we blow something off and they treat us like, oh man, this guy's being, it hurts us. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So I have this panic attack. And so to describe it for people out there, when we have an anxiety or panic attack, I feel like I'm having a heart attack. That's right. Right? The walls shoot, start caving in. I start sweating like crazy. My eyes start darting around. And you're you're nodding yes, right? Uh, you start getting kind of short of breath. My hand starts shaking. And, um, man, you, you feel like you're about to die. You feel That's like right. you're going to have a heart attack. That's right. The walls start caving in. Well, this was 2005. So we didn't talk about mental health back then. We didn't talk about panic anxiety attacks. So for 10 years, I was getting checked out for a heart attack. Mm, same, 10 years. Same, right? Same exact thing. That's why I want people to hear us go, hey, you're safe. You're okay. And the moment I started talking about this, when I did Good Morning America with Stray to announce this, like I've had one every single time I've ever been on TV since then. Even scripted stuff like ballers, which I know we could just stop. So it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I wouldn't say it to anybody on our show. We're doing a live show and, mm-hmm. and I want to ruin their live show. So I've had to learn how to deal with it on my own right. Um, but Michael's like, every single week, I'm like, Every week. He's like, since I've worked at Fox, I said, every week. Wow. And, you know, again, imagine what we're going through, right? We're going th- we're going to get our heart checked out all this mm-hmm. time, and the doctors can't figure out what's going on, so it's getting more frustrating. So now, for everybody out there who's listening to this, if you're having these things, you're safe. You're okay. Like, for me, I try and crack a joke. If you see me on Fox force a joke in that really doesn't make any sense... <laughs> It's because I'm having a really bad time, panic attack. <laughs> That's me. Now you know, right? That's me <laughs> laughing at something I shouldn't be laughing right? at. You know what I mean? Just because, you know, I want to, I guess I'm trying to create the energy that I would like to feel in that moment. So if everything feels lighter, then it makes yes. me feel lighter, yep. I guess. Yep, yep. Right. I, I call it, you know, I call it the gray. Mm-hmm. So I always say the gray hates laughter. Mm-hmm. So fast as I could laugh, you know, it, it gets me through it. And I, I have some other things too, like um, when I'm having it, I'll kind of, Talk, I almost talk at it. Um, I call it my abuser, like I'm wrestling with my abuser, and I'll I'll talk myself through it. I'll coach myself through it. I'll breathe. I'll keep making sure I know it's not it's not real. Nothing's happening. Like I'm not in danger or anything like that. But I've had a lot of since I've done this. I've had a lot of people, big 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 people, who said, "Oh my God, that's what it is." Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I had a friend call nine one one recently before he heard me talk about it, but he was afraid to give him their name because of who he was. And he's like, oh, my God, thank God I heard you. Because he's like, that's messed with me ever since. Mm. So it's the same thing. It became, like, it became habitual for me. Did mm-hmm. it, for you also? A hundred percent. I mean, and even what you were saying about, and I, I used to do the same thing, go to the emergency room, mm. you know, for heart attacks, thinking I'm having a heart attack. And it was one of the last times, the last time I went is when I finally realized it was anxiety because the doctor said that to me. The doctor was like, <sighs> I was describing it to him, and he was like, has this happened to you before? I'm like, yeah, all the time. <laughs> right. And he was like, do you suffer from anxiety? I'm like, I don't even know what that is. He was like, it's not oh. like you had an anxiety attack. And in my mind, at the time, I had just gotten fired for the fourth time from radio, and I was back living wow. at home with my mom. I was like 31, 32. My daughter was two. My now wife was back living at home with her mom. So the doctor was like, are you stressed out about wow. anything? And I'm like, hell yeah. So in my <laughs> mind, all I got to do is get another job, and everything will be good. Wow. And the next job I got was this. Wow. But then, you know. But fun. then you came, you got this, but you were now mm-hmm. you were armed with the information that, okay, you just, an anxiety attack. I'm okay. Yeah, You're no, able to handle better. No, no I, I still didn't know yet. I, but I, I felt like once I got the job, all of that'll go away. Right. But That's, nothing it changed. Don't work like that. No, yeah. no. Everything, no, the, everything got worse. The anxiety, the more yep. money, the more success. Everything, anxiety, yeah. depression, everything just got worse. Because now you have things to lose. That's right. When I was making ninety seven hundred bucks a year for those eleven years. That's right. I was re- I was more relentless. Guy had nothing to lose. That's right. Right. And I was just crazy Jay. I was fine. But now all of a sudden I have things to lose. You're right. The anxiety became better. Be- became stronger and that's where like the first three chapters of this of or me and my journey up my 9700 bucks a year and getting through being broke and i said man all of a sudden i became the first ever breaking news guy you know nfl inside america in 99 and then the first you know at, at fox this and then the first million dollar insider and this and that and that and then we made it to the television hall of fame and i'm on freaking ballers and the first host of you you know mixed martial arts show in america and i was like it's gonna be rainbows and unicorns and that's not how it is at all like, my wallet is not an antidepressant. <laughs> right? And Absolutely. I was, and even that, then I had to wrestle with, like, damn, I thought I was going to do all these things and I'd have money and some stability and security. And uh, I, unless we can 
deal with it from the inside out. No amount of money in the world. And I know people are going to go, oh, j-. again, we've been on both sides of it. We've been on, we've been broke and unbreakable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we can talk to both sides of it. We, we got to figure out a way to, to make ourselves wealthy from the inside out. I think it's because, you know, like I'm a stern believer that your thoughts become things, mm-hmm. right? And so I think about all of the things that I manifested in yeah. my mind, right? So it's like when you start having all those negative thoughts and you mm-hmm. start thinking about everything that could go wrong, like you mm-hmm. start having more anxiety and more panic attacks because you think you're manifesting yeah. it into your life. And you're waiting for it to happen. You're waiting right? for that it to sucks. happen. sucks. Lord, have mercy. Right? Yes. How therapeutic is this though, right? No, no, no. <laughs> right? Definitely 100%. Right? 100%. I was going to ask you, you know, you, they said that the, the Rock helped you with deal with yeah. your depression. Yeah, we help each other. So, so how did you guys help each other? How did y'all get to that that point? Of and that's why he wrote the forward mm-hmm. for the book, which he doesn't do at all. Mm-hmm. And he said, dude, you're going to be the voice for all of us in the gray, which is amazing. And um, we met, I don't know, 15 years ago. And then um, we uh, when I went and did Ballers, I was only supposed to be on one episode of Ballers. Mm-hmm. And I'm not an actor. I mean, again, the ADD part, I can't remember a script. Right. So I would come in there and just mess with them. And then they were like, oh, this is good. And they were just, hey, roll, roll. And then all of a sudden, hey, can you can you stay another day? I'm like, sure, whatever. And then I just got five years of in with him. And every time I'd go there, I would just, like, I run a good, a fun locker room. Like, it, you know, I'm always, part of my thing is I'm always laughing because it, it gets me through the gray. So I would just come over there and just kind of mess with him all the time. And, uh, like, who else does? Well, who can he talk to about this? Right. Like, he's got to be, he, he seems perfect all the time. Who could he talk to about this? We yeah. all need somebody. And yeah. we lashed on each other. I think because of my vulnerability, because I was so open with it, with him, and, and had no shame as I was talking, um, he was able to lean on me more, and the two of us leaned on each other. Mm-hmm. I, had a, I had a horrible attack last Saturday. Say, this one woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And that, that normally doesn't happen, but it woke me up and like <gasps> kind of grabbed my chest and woke up in sweats, and it, that was that's probably the worst one I've had in... Um, Man, it's one of the worst ones I've had probably in the last couple of years. That one was hard. Like, I felt like these freaking gray chains pulling me through the center of the, like, down. It was awful. So now I know to immediately, again, like, I have these three pillars in these books that, that I'll do. And one of them to, is to have a team. So I'll call people and say, hey, I am struggling today. Mm-hmm. So he was, the, I think he was the first guy I called. I said, dude, I am I said, I'm going to go on and on and on here because I'm a little manic right now because I don't know what's going on. I am struggling. And I left him this message. Boom. Stepped right out of filming. Called me. Um, so I called four people like that. Called someone to come over. Called someone to come over and train with. Because, like, training for me is a great antidepressant, even if I don't feel like doing it. But then the other thing I did is I called four other people just to see how they're doing. Mm. And so, like, being a service mm-hmm. for me is huge. So I called them. Without them knowing that I'm going through it, just checking up on you, man. Just telling you I love you. How you doing? I just want to see how you're doing. So that kind of got me through it, but that lasted the whole day. But he was the first dude I called. I, I'm, gl- I'm glad you're here this week because, you know, you, I, I've been saying since the whole situation at the Oscars, the conversation that we're mm-hmm. not having is the conversation about mental health, is mm-hmm. the conversation about emotional intelligence, you know, men having a safe space. They express their emotions in a real mm-hmm. way. And you talk about somebody like The Rock. Who does he feel like he can talk to? Right. Same thing with somebody like a Will Smith. Yes. So it's like when you see a person snap like that, <clears throat> mm-hmm. like when I see it, I see something totally different. I'm looking at, oh, he's hurt. I saw it your way. Yeah. He's in pain. So he's got a lot of pain. Yeah. 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 He's in a lot of pain. And again, that whole thing I said, hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people, people yeah. Right? So he's in a lot of pain. Listen, because of my own stuff, I will never, ever throw stones. Like someone's going through something, man, I just want them to get help. But again, for me, I, I, have people I'm safe enough with to turn to about it, mm-hmm. but I'm collecting them now. Had I not done this book, I wouldn't have had Strayhan to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I wouldn't have. Like, I just never, I was just too ashamed. And again, I saw it exactly how you my head's a guy in a lot of pain, and I hope he, he could find his, his rock that he can turn to immediately, or his Stray, or somebody along those lines he can turn to immediately, and also know, like, man, we're, fl- we're flawed people. That's right. We deserve to get this help. And, and the biggest thing, too, with mental health is... I think the only way we're going to get ahead, it's so reactive right now, right? We go and call our therapist when the sky is falling, when things happen. Mm-hmm. We train our bodies every day. Mm-hmm. We need to start training our minds every day. We need to start, instead of mental health, we need to make it mental fitness almost and start every day. So I have three therapists I deal with all the time, mm-hmm. um, and they all kind of serve a different purpose. But even when things are going great, I'll make sure I 
I never miss a session. I don't want to miss a session. We got to keep doing that when it's, we have to make it more proactive than reactive. And when you're talking about with, with Will, and again, I have no idea what goes on in his life. So I, mm-hmm. it, it's hard for me to say. Um, but he's talked about it. He's talked about like, you know, he always felt like a coward and a punk because growing up, his his dad used to beat his mom, and mm-hmm. he never intervened. Oh, that's hard. That's yeah, a lot of pain. Yeah, so he's always been dealing that's a lot of with pain. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that, that's the other thing too. I had to learn how to give myself a break. Mm-hmm. I, I I I would like to, I, I don't know. If, I would say no one beats up on themselves more than I do. I don't know if that's true or not because I don't know anybody else's life. But man, I beat up on myself a lot, mm-hmm. and I shamed myself a lot, and I just looked at myself with, um, yeah, like I, I'm very self-loathing. Um, so I had to learn to give myself permission to love myself up. Mm. But everybody out there needs to give themselves permission. Like it's time we start loving ourselves up. That's if right. we start learning to love ourselves up, we probably wouldn't tweet so much bad crap to each other on, on Twitter and root for everybody else to go down. Or, or project our pain on the people like mm-hmm. Will did to Chris because now yep. Chris is probably reliving a lot of his childhood trauma because he used to right? get bullied and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, Chris could take a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta say, that was impressive. As a guy in the fight game, I'm like, damn, he kind of lowered his levels, took it, and man, rolled with it. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. And I like Chris a lot. It's, it, I, but yeah, I think how humiliating that was for him. I was mm-hmm. gonna ask, so what do you, what do you tell people that come up to you? Because I'm sure so many people come up to you, so they're facing depression or yeah. anxiety. So what do you tell them they can do to help them in that situation? Right. The first thing I do is thank them. Like, man, think how brave this was for you. Right, your vulnerability again. Vulnerability is true strength. I'm like, mm-hmm. dude, that's courageous. That's cool that you come up to me and say something like that. Even though I do remind everybody, I am not anyone's therapist. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not been schooled in this. Correct. All I'm trying to do is get us all to have one big team together. Like I need the team. I did it for everybody else, but it's just as much for me, so I can have more of a team and more teammates that we can lean on each other. But I tell people, hey, find your team. Right, talk to people, mm-hmm. and I tell people. Again, like everyone I've opened up to has, it's brought us closer together. And it'll also help you find your team because everybody else acts like, oh, you know, suck it up. Okay, that's not your teammate. Right? You know how to put your, your energy into. The other one is be of service. So like even when I was broke, I figured out ways to, living here in New York, I would, um, I would literally try and help homeless guys get jobs when I was broke. Just, I was at New York One TV. I was like, oh, man, I'm famous. It was New York One TV. Mm-hmm. And I would take them into fast food restaurants and try and help them get jobs. Didn't really cost me any money. Um, I would go to the 99-cent store and get, like, toothbrush, toothpaste, handy wipes, gloves, socks. And me and my son, we'd go hand them out at 6 bucks, 7 bucks. Mm-hmm. So be a server. Or call someone, like I said, and say, man, how you doing? Mm-hmm. Just checking up on you. Right? So there's ways for us to be of service. and Or, like, I started a charity. There's different ways. Mm-hmm. But every day I'll figure out something um and the last thing is again man we gotta we gotta learn to love ourselves up and laugh like we've got to laugh so as bad as it gets figure out a way to laugh or laugh at somebody we have to it's it's our kind of our that's our that's our superpower here you say you never know what lies around next tuesday Mm -hmm. what does that mean um so again those those first 11 years of my life when i was yeah i was working 100 hour weeks making 9700 bucks a year um a lot of rejection. Like, so I decided I'm going to outwork everybody. I'm going to outwork the world and trying to get a full-time job. Man, I'm, you know, again, I, and I was trying to do it different than everybody else. When I first walked in that giant locker room, they had their own way of doing stuff. I'm like, well, I, I can't do it their way. I don't have the education as everybody else. I don't have the experience that anybody has. I got kicked out of my first college in a semester and a half with uh, quote-unquote disciplinary problems. Um, <laughs> I wasn't great. Um, so I just I wasn't I just wasn't an equal footing. But what I can do is I said, how could I be different? So if these cats work 40 hours a week, I'm going to work 100. If they were using their pen as a weapon, I'm going to start relationships with people. Mm. And man, I will be the last dude standing in here. And however long it takes, I'll do it. That's how I'm going to go after my dreams. Well, that overnight success is 11 years. And so every week I would get rejected over and over and over and over. And every week, man, I literally look at the fourth commandment. Like I'll look at Look at a, I'm a big God guy, but I'll look at like different passages and anything that could help. And Fourth Commandment says, hey, take a day off and drink some wine. Like, don't threaten me with a good time. Mm-hmm. So every single week, I would literally go after everything, six days a week, get rejected 50 times. I don't know who's been rejected more than me in their journey. Like, I, I was, man, it was awful. Um, over and over and over. Whoever said quitting's not an option is a freaking moron because it's the easiest it's option in the world. It's always yeah. there. And, 
Um, finally, 11 years in, oh, and I would, so I'd take, you know, six days were over. I'd take my one day, <sighs> I'd exhale. Whatever happened this past week, it's over. And then start each week, I would say, God, I'm not asking you to get me this job or make me rich or get me this money. All I want is not to be alone. I got it. I'll do it. Just pick me up, brush me off, and let's keep walking this walk together. So I never looked at it as um, 11 years of being rejected. Looked at it as 11 years of one-week periods of being rejected for that full-time job. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, like, you never know what lies around next Tuesday. Because eventually on a Tuesday, I got that that full-time job. Wow. Eventually. Like one day, and my agent calls me, and I got rejected by a billion agents. And this guy, Maury Gostran, says, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to drive around you with Tiki Barber and... You know, just it's the Giants off day on Tuesday. And he says, okay, you can finally exhale. I said, what's up? He said, we finally got you a full-time job. I said, what? Where? He said, CBS Sports. They just got football back in 99. You're going to be their NFL insider. I said, oh, my God. I'll take it. He says, don't you want to know how much it's for? I said, I don't give a crap. <laughs> I could care because it validated me 11 years early when I said I'll be the last dude standing. Right. So I say you never know what lies around next Tuesday. And same thing like my co-author in this book, uh, Sarah Tomlinson. I didn't let her know until the very, I sent the last chapter in on the last day that this book was due. So I sent 12 chapters in and I held the last one. And the last one was the only reason I chose Sarah to be my co-author of everybody else is because she beat cancer. Mm, wow. And I said to her, listen, I know it sucked. You had cancer at the time. I know it sucked. But that's my thing. Like, you never know what lies around next Tuesday. You being cancer, I viewed you as someone that, man, you went through your deepest, darkest time and it could not break you. And you came through that other side of that tunnel. So I get you and you're going to get me. And so if you didn't have cancer, like it sucks. But if you didn't have it, I wouldn't have chosen you. If I didn't choose you, like right now, she's loving life of how many people we're empowering and saving mm-hmm. and lifting up. That's my thing about you never know what lies around next Tuesday. And that's why we got to hold on. Like, your life could change next week. Mm-hmm. You have no idea. Or you could change somebody else's life next week. Mm-hmm. That's why we got always have to have that hope. And you use social media every day. You post uh, mental health check-ins mm-hmm. daily. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to wait for the book to come out to help people. Um, it was kind of driving me crazy. I'm like, ah, man, I can't wait for people to read this. I can't wait to lift these. It was kind of driving me nuts. So I asked my team, I said, you know, um, I want to start early if you guys are okay with it. So I started doing these. If you go on my social media, I started doing very, very, very real, raw um, mental health checkups. So, like, when I'm having a, when I'm in a bad place, I film it so people know they're not alone. I show it. And you, when I have a, my depression, anxiety are kicking into high gear, it physically affects me. It's a physical, visceral reaction. Absolutely. Right? So, like, I feel it on the left side of my gut really bad, like a gut punch, right? Um, like behind my rib cage again, I feel like I'm having a heart attack and it kind of hurts. Um, my joints feel like I just came out of like a 50 round fight. I sweat like crazy. My eyes are again all over the place. So I want to start showing people what it's really like. Not that filtered crap, not what we're trying, not like, you know, dressed up posts with a lot of glossy stuff, what it's really like. So at the same time, when I'm having a, a good day or how we get to a good day. I want to show that. So I started posting those a couple months ago to, you know, walk this walk with people, show them they're not, show them what's really like. Mm-hmm. That they're not alone and, and not dress it up. It's been, that's been, um, that's been pretty cool. Yeah. No, unbreakable. That's right. Jay Glazer. Next time you got to come up here, you're in town. We'll talk football. This is not the Let's right Let's do it, five. man. Nah, yeah. this, this, is, this was great for everybody out man, there. Man, I appreciate that Coming so much. Yeah, make sure y'all grab Unbreakable, how I turn my depression and anxiety into motivation, and you can too, but my man, you know, Jay Glazer. Like I say, man, if it's always the only way to eradicate the stigma around mental mm-hmm. health is everybody got to tell their story, and I'm glad you're, you're telling yours, it. my brother. I, I had somebody, a doctor, tell me the other day, oh, 2% of the country have this. I'm like, 2%? What freaking study are you looking at? <laughs> exactly. 2%. Exactly. I think we're in the majority. We just need to start speaking out more so we can feel like we're in the majority, and then we won't feel so alone anymore. That's Absolutely. right. Well, it's Jay Glazer. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning.